Today, I'm speaking with Bill Guthrie. Bill, thank you so much for joining me today. Glad to be here. Thank and Bill you. is sure. And Bill's joining me all the way from Washington State. You got up early to meet my schedule requirements, so I really appreciate that. Um, what no what problem. part of Washington State are you in, by the way? Yakima, Washington, Central Washington. Okay. What's that part of the state like? I've never been out there. Well, it's on the east side of the state, and it's pretty hot, deserty, dry. The west side is pretty moist. Seattle, Tacoma areas. Um, but yeah, it's hot. It's hot. It's like over 100 right now. Mm. I mean, not at the moment, but the days of getting, getting over 100, it's been pretty hot. And do you ever go to the beach from where you are? Or is it a pretty yeah, big drive? Pretty drive? I seldom go, but uh, no. And you're not too far from Canada, obviously, either. Yeah, I don't get up there much either. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, I've heard some great things about Washington State. I'd love to visit there myself someday. Um, Bill is a former carpenter and contractor, and you even did some medical work as, a, as an RN. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about your carpentry background and anything else about yourself that I don't know? Well, I, when I got, got out of high school, I just work, went to work as a carpenter, um, did that for four years, and then I uh, got religious and uh, got went to Bible college and then uh, encountered some questions and uh, and decided to go back to work in construction again. Did that for a few more years. I went back to Bible college and then went back to construction again. And then uh, then I deconverted and then I worked in construction for probably another 10 years and then decided I was bored with that. So I went back to school, became an RN, did that for four years and didn't like it. And I quit and then sort of went back to construction on my own, just doing handyman construction repairs for people, things like that. That's awesome. Been doing it ever since. Yeah. Well, it definitely has a close spot in my heart too. I used to be a custom cabinet maker and uh, grew up in a wood shop. My dad was a wood shop teacher. Oh, yeah. And so I grew up making just, you know, handicraft things, just, uh, you know, little shelves and cutting boards and things like that, that you'd give for Christmas presents. But um, yeah. when I worked as a, a custom cabinet maker, it was really, it was fun to kind of learn the, the trade a little bit. So good stuff there. That's yeah, fun. Nice yeah. to be able to do stuff for yourself too and use your hands. Oh yeah. Do you have any hobbies these days you're pursuing that uh, are of interest? No, oh, I've had a few right now. I'm, well, I've been ra raising canaries and finches and that doing that for 25 years. It's kind of fun. Like to sell them or just for your own? I, I did. I did sell them. I haven't done it so much uh, anymore, but for a while I had a an aviary. I turned one of the bedrooms in my home into an open aviary and they were just flying all over there and nests. And I had like, oh, maybe 150 birds at one time. Yeah. And then now I'm down to about 20. Yeah. So yeah, I did that. That's Do they fun. keep you up at night with their chirping? Nope. They go to sleep. That's good. That's <laughs> they good. go to sleep when the sun goes down. Awesome. Yeah, that and I uh, garden a bit and I've done scuba diving. I had a pilot's license, but I kind of let that lapse. Um, any other hobbies? I have vintage cars. I restore old cars. I've had quite a few in my life and repair. Mm. You know, did all my own work, you know, mechanical and do auto body and painting on them. You sound like what we would have called a jack of all trades. Sound like there's yeah. uh, very little you wouldn't be able to tackle if you had had a chance to. Yeah, I try to try not to pay somebody else to do it. I try to figure out how to do it myself. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Cool. Well, I would love to uh, hear about your story. Uh, what <laughs> what kind of background did you have uh, religious-wise, and how did this whole thing start? Well, I was, you know, I, my first memory that I remember is I remember when I was a little kid, probably, I'm thinking six or seven. I remember we had a house with a basement. I remember going down there. And my dad had, had gave me this little New Testament saying, this is God's word. This is the word of God. You know, if you anything you need to know about God or, you know, how to live life, it's all the answers are right here. And I go, OK, you know, I just, you know, just believe what he said. And we our family didn't go to church much. Uh, we I guess my dad said that uh, that he and my mom couldn't agree on a church to go to. So we went to Assembly of God a little bit, and I remember going to Nazarene Church a little bit. But you know, I remember in Sunday school, they the, the little felt paper things they put up on there, and they talk about Jesus and the cross and the blood and doing little things like that. So you know, I grew up believing. I just believed it. You know, okay, this is you know we're sinners. Uh, we need Jesus. He died on the cross. You know, Do you remember okay. if your if your parents would have definitely claimed that as their 
faith, like not just like a cultural, you know, we go to church to because everyone else does, but like we actually really <clears throat> deeply believe that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. Yeah, they they did. I don't. I think they didn't really talk about it much, though. You know, but, but I, they did believe that they believe in the Bible, believe in God. They, they believe. It. They did, I don't think we're as verbal as a lot of people are about it. I remember my dad saying that he didn't want to push it on us because he saw too many people rebel and go away from it because it was pushed on them. And so I said, okay, yeah, that sounds reasonable. But so that was sort of my childhood. I just kind of grew up with that, you know. And we there was a. I remember we had this little book. I can't. I said. I remember saying, "I see what God wants us to know." So I don't know what it was. I can't remember who the publisher was, but I remember going through it and reading it, and you know, talking about stealing as being a sin and lying being a sin, and so, so you learned the morality of it all, and it you know made sense. And so I grew up really thinking about morality and being a good person. You know, so and so I just accepted that I believed all of this and just kind of kept. We didn't go to church, like I said, but I still believed it all. And so I guess the next thing that I'm thinking really, I remember my, we moved into the country when I was like in the sixth grade. And I, I don't remember what happened. Anyway, my mom, I remember my mom buying like a living Bible. This living Bible came out some, at some point. And I remember getting that. And I remember actually reading it. Um, I hated, for the most part, I hated reading, <clears throat> but I did to spend some time reading that because like in school you had to read certain amounts i remember okay i'll just read the bible you know and so i would read it and I remember reading some different things and everything and that's just kind of weird you know i remember but well, mostly i would focus on the new testament reading what jesus said and all his sayings and i thought this is great stuff you know and i absorbed it and uh i guess i considered myself a christian but i remember reading the, I remember reading the part of, in the Old Testament where I can't, I can't remember if it was a Moabite or something where uh, they said, okay, we'll join you all. Uh, we'll join you people. And all you got to do is get circumcised. And they said, okay, so they get circumcised and then they go slaughter them. I thought, what? You know, they slaughter these people. Oh, well, you know, God must, you know, have a reason. There must have been, because, you know, when you grow up with that, you, they're growing up, you think oh, there's Christians, good people, and then there are these bad, evil, non Christian atheists or whatever they are. So you have all these good people and bad people. So, you know, God, does, I guess he's justified in wiping out these bad, evil people. You know, so I, I guess that's how I probably justified that in some of the atrocities that I now see in the Old Testament. But yeah. So anyway, I remember reading, reading the Bible quite a bit you know, and seeing those things. But With the church that you were uh, <laughs> sometimes going to, do you recall if there was a real strong push for the gospel, like uh, what, what you might call a, a gospel message and uh, some kind of altar call where they, they would say, it isn't enough to just be in church. It isn't enough to even, you know, believe that the Bible is, is some kind of divine message. Like you actually have to have this transaction where Christ's righteousness becomes yours, becomes imputed to you. You, know, you turn from your sin to Christ and you say, I want your righteousness to cover me. And, you know, Christ takes your sin, pays the penalty and becomes your actual personal savior. Was there any kind of personal invitation that you recall as a young man growing up just saying, you know, this isn't, you can't just come to church and call yourself a Christian. You actually have to be Christ. You have to be, belong to him and give yourself to him. Was that kind of message preached at all as far as you know, as when you were younger? Well, that sort of, that, that, sort of in junior high, that's where that sort of started filtering. Because I really didn't go to church much, but I, I remember you know wanting to learn more about God and Jesus and things. <clears throat> and uh, my sister, she she had a friend that was her path. Her dad her dad was a missionary or was really devout Christian, and he <clears throat> he actually ended up taking them to Liberia to be missionaries. Well, she went to this Bible camp. I think I was like, I think I was in the ninth grade or something by then. And we went to this Bible camp and they were, that's where they were. I remember going there and they were talking about accepting Jesus and stuff like that. And I kind of was confused by it. I thought, well, I, I believe in Jesus. I accept Jesus. You know, I just, I didn't, and I remember hearing some, some people speaking in tongues. And I thought that's just kind of weird stuff. And so hmm. I didn't know what it was. And I remember 
kneeling down and, you know, they say, well, you need to accept Jesus. I remember kneeling down. This is, I must've been like 14 or 15. I can't remember, but, and this guy came up, came up to me and says, do you accept Jesus? And I said, well, yeah, you know? And so, and so I go, okay. I was kind of confused by it, but I kind of, yeah. And so I, you know, I got baptized and okay, I'm a Christian, whatever, you know? And so I just kept going on. Then I remember going back the next year to this Bible camp and doing the, you know, same sort of similar, the fun stuff you do at Bible camp, you know, but I felt like I had a relationship with Jesus Christ then. So that continued um, through, you know, through high school. I remember I considered myself a Christian. I had some different Christian friends. If you would have had a, like a close call with a car accident or something where you would have thought, wow, I could have died there. Would you have said that you would have had complete peace that if you had died, you would have gone to heaven? Like, was there any question about what it would have been like if, if for example, if you died and God said, why should I let you in? What your, what the right answer biblically would have been? I probably, I probably wouldn't have been very good at it. I probably would have known for sure. Well, I would probably say, well, Jesus died for my sins. You know, he's my savior. He's, you know, but, you know, the, the thing, I think there's thing, I sort of had this sort of, I think I was pretty naive and ignorant about a lot of it, you know. Um, like the doctrines of it? Yeah. Yeah. Probably pretty much. Yeah. Uh, Cause I really didn't go to church. I remember going to a church um, downtown one time. So I kind of wanted to, but I didn't know where to go or what to do. And so I remember just driving and going to this church downtown and uh, going in and kind of think, oh, okay, you know, and it didn't really do anything for me. Hmm. So yeah, I wouldn't have been able to probably talk about it theologically, you know, sure. under, I was, I was pretty, had a pretty basic knowledge or understanding. Did you have any fear of hell at that point? Like what if, it was you were on I the think wrong I, side of the equation. Probably maybe a, a little bit, but I, I think that well, I think I'm doing all I need all, all I know to do, I guess. I hope I don't go there, but I, I mean, mm -hmm. so it's sort of like I wasn't absolutely certain. So it sounds interesting where your your story is a little bit different from a lot of the people I speak with, where it sounds like there wasn't the intensity of like like a lot of people are were afraid of, of like, what if I didn't really get saved the first time? So let's do it again and again and again and make sure. And like, what if I get left behind in the rapture? I could be, you know, here for the tribulation. And, you know, if Jesus comes, I want to be one of the people that he takes up to heaven and to be with him in the clouds. It sounds like that intensity of it all was not necessarily part of your experience as a teenager. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I can remember as a teenager think, thinking, OK, I, I don't think I'm going to graduate from high school. I think Jesus is gonna, probably going to come back again. I don't okay. think, it, I think, I think it's almost on the verge. I mean, yeah, it was more like, I, I think I'll probably go, I think, you know, I, I didn't really know. But. Gotcha. But it wasn't like this intense sense of like angst about it. Like what if I'm no. on the wrong side of this? Okay. I guess I didn't hear a lot of hellfire type preaching up to that point. That came later. Okay. So that's what led to my, you know, my conversion, my actual, what I later considered or thought was a born again emotional experience and so then i thought okay i never really had a relationship well, i can i can go into that but. yeah well, just one last question before you do that um did you know anybody growing up that wasn't a christian and did you remember any thoughts about i wonder how this works for you know you know mr buddhist or, or mrs uh you know muslim you know somebody mr atheist somebody that's like huh they they're not they're not like us did you have any recollection of that kind of person in your background I, and just um, the, the worrying about what, what's their eternal salvation like well yeah i mean I, I probably didn't give it a lot of thought but i remember thinking that well if they're you know they're probably going to go to hell if they're not a christian you know mm -hmm. i didn't really honestly i didn't really give it much thought i was busy with other things just, i'm a christian right. they're not you know they're probably gonna i really wasn't into it by at that point when i was yeah. in you know high school sure. and stuff. Well, what what happens next then in your story Sounds like it's about to get a little bit more in. Uh, yeah, that's when, it, that's when it all kind of turned into a mess. Um, you know, I, I told you when I was like in high school, right, this experience with the guy said, well, do you accept Jesus? I go, yeah, you know, and I got baptized. Said, okay, I'm a Christian. Well, then my sister, when I was like 20, she started dating a guy who was going to a, a you know, fundamentalist Baptist, you know, hellfire preaching type thing, you know, and he would, I, so I kind of went and he would say, well, do you know for sure, without a doubt, you'd go to heaven if you died? And I go, well, 
And I don't know. I, I guess I do, but I don't. I can't say that I know for sure. And so we need to, you know, this whole, you know, if you have a real relationship with God, you know it. You, you, you know, you would know it. You, there's no doubt in your mind. I thought, well, I have doubts and wonders. So, you know, and so listening to that quite a few times, I guess it got, you know, maybe back then, maybe I would just, I just knew about Jesus. Maybe I really didn't have a relationship with Jesus. I, I probably didn't. I, 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 if he says you can know, then you, I don't know. And so, and after, you know, after hearing this over and over again, and, you know, they would have altar calls and hellfire stuff and all that stuff. And I finally just, I came to, well, there's another part of the story, but I was really feeling a little bit, you know, concerned about this, you know, that I really wasn't a Christian. Well, my sister, this guy that she had dated, um, she ended up marrying him. Well, the day after they got married, he died. He, you know, wow. he had a heart condition. He had a valve in his heart already. Uh, he had a heart problem. Anyway, he died the next day. And I go, whoa, you know, it was a shocker. And That's then so I just sad. think, you know, you know, it could happen. And I just, I just think, you know, I've been hearing this. I think I don't know that I'd go to heaven and it could happen to me. I, I, uh, I think I'm really lost. You know, I, I, I'm, I, I'm not really a Christian. I just been thinking I was. And so one night I was, you know, in my living room, I'd be in the living room thinking about all this is going in my head, you know, and I heard, you know, the gospel, you have to confess you're a lost sinner and you're going to hell and you need Jesus, you know, and he's the savior and you confess and you ask him in your heart. And, and I did that. And I just felt this huge emotional release. Uh, I, I interpreted that as being the Holy Spirit filling me, cleansing me from my sin. I said, this is it. This is I now have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I never had it before. I mean, now he's, you know, you know, this personal relationship. And, it's, it's, and so like, I would just, I was floored by it. Hmm. I mean, I have a different way of interpreting it now, but I just know, I think it was just the stress of all, you know, because you so much is put in your head. You think that this is real and it, and it has this emotional, you know, but release or whatever. You were finally finally really a christian it wasn't yeah cult cultural or casual it was yeah it so was so yeah so i was 20 <clears throat> so i was 20 years old right then and so then i'm like okay this is real i uh, you need to accept jesus i never actually repented saw myself as a lost sinner and uh i did this and uh, now i have a relationship with jesus christ and so then from then on i just i have a real relationship with jesus christ and and uh, I started telling other people about it. And you know, I just went sort of you know, crazy with it in a sense. Put people hmm. off. But I was, I was a hardcore nut, really. Can I ask so, real quick, how did, your, how did your sister do with healing from the, the loss? I imagine that um, must have been pretty intense. Yeah, it took her. It, she did, she's done fairly well. I mean, that yeah, was a shocker. Yeah. Um, hmm. But... Yeah, she. I remember, you know, visiting her afterwards, and it, it took her a while to get over it. And then she was remarried about a year later, and so. But you know, that's uh, mm -hmm. another issue. Yeah, but uh, that definitely pulls yeah. at the heartstrings. Um, I, I've yeah. not had that kind of issue, but I, I remember <clears throat> uh, when I was growing up, the uh, pastor of the church I went to for the majority of my uh, young teenage years and young adulthood. Um, his daughter had married someone and I think right around a year exactly like at their one year anniversary or something yeah. he just suddenly died in his sleep or something yeah. and it was it was like a traumatic thing to um, just to kind of see it from the sidelines and I can't imagine seeing it up close like that after one day I mean that's wow that'll that'll take yeah, I, a while I, to recover from I think it I think it was probably I mean it's, it's just more of a shock effect I think it would, probably would have been even more difficult in some ways, if they had been married for a long time, you know. Yeah, that's true. And, and, but there's your birds. Anyway. I hear them. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, that's yeah. That's chickens outside. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. I w would you say that your um, this last question about your sister? Would you say that th there was definitely a sense of that this was must have been God's will? There must be some sense of peace in this. Yes, we've lost something 
Um, this is, you know, going to hurt for a while, but God is in control of this. He has a plan and we can trust him through this. Yeah, I think, I think that that was, yeah, I think that that was part of the mentality, but at the same time, well, you know, this is, you know, you, even when, when I was in that, you, you know, I, I would think that, but I think, does this really fit? You know, I, I, even though, you know, I was really into it, there's still part of me in the back of my head that would say, hmm, there's, there's, a, there's some irrational, illogical things about this. It doesn't quite fit. So I think she was, she's sort of similar in that way. Even though, even though I was on, you know, when I was into it, even deep into it, I, there was still this little thing going, hmm, you know, always going, hmm, that doesn't, but, you know, I'll, I'll know the answers. I'll just keep digging and keep digging. I'll keep going and it'll all, you know, once I learn more, it'll all come together and I'll have it all figured out, you know, because it's God's word is the answers, you know, it's someplace a little kid, you know, it's God's word. And I didn't really know that much about the Bible. I didn't know about the history of the Bible, how it's put together and, you know, all this stuff. I just hmm. had, didn't know that Paul, I didn't think about Paul's letters or the gospels being anonymous or, you know, all this stuff. It just, it's God's word. I'm just reading, getting stuff out of it. I think she was in a similar place that I was. It's God's will, you know, God will work it out. There's a reason for everything. You know, that mentality, even though this party says, eh, but, oh. yeah. We think, oh, that's just doubt and questioning, trying to creep in Satan or whatever. You know how that is. Yeah. There's the, always the ultimate Trump card of, you know, we may never know in this life, but God will certainly, yeah. oh, yeah. yeah. Certainly make it right and make it clear in the next life that uh, he had yeah. a plan and this was all, all pre preset yeah. by him for his yeah. glory. Uh -huh. So yeah, so I had this this experience, and I was on fire, and then I the, and I was so I just started going to church. I mean, every Sunday, every Wednesday, or we it, this church had it on Tuesdays, but so every Wednesday, every every Saturday, Sunday, I would go to visitation on Saturdays. I mean, I started going door to door evangelizing, and I mean, I got all these tracks. I'd go down, hand out tracks, you know, telling people about Jesus and being born again and all that stuff. And so like they I said, I started chick hmm? chick tracks. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, those chick tracks. <laughs> oh, there was one that you know. There's one that I liked a lot. I had to like. I can't remember what it was name. I saw somebody posted it somewhere not long ago online. Said, oh yeah, I remember passing that one out. I had to had this guy. His life story went on in the Andes, cast in a lake of fire. But I remember passing those out. But um, yeah, those chick tracks. Yeah, they can pack a punch. I mean, it's some yeah. of those uh, things from back in the, you know, when they started in the I don't know 70s, 80s, whenever. Uh, they they hit they hit home, oh, yeah. especially if you if you're really in tune with them. And I, did you ever listen to a group called Family Radio? Um, mm -hmm. They're out in California, and um, they're, they're probably most well known eventually for Harold Camping, who I think is past now. But he had set a date for Christ's return three or four times, and the last time he was basically like, "I've I've absolutely figured everything out. I am sure there will be no reset on this. This is it. Jesus is coming back at such and such a date." And of course, you know, it, it, it came and came and passed and um, really, really sad outcome for a lot of people who, you know, sold their homes so that they could buy billboards and, um, mm -hmm. you know, pay for this to say, hey, the Lord's coming back. This is your last two weeks to repent, so to speak. But huh. anyway, they, um, they, for me, it was interesting. They would have these, these programs that we would listen to as kids at night. And one of them was, you know, like the old time organs, uh, like they were, oh, yeah. they can kind of draw out the notes. Uh, well, they, they would tell these stories. Uh, I forget what it's called, but um, I think it was some headquartered in Chicago. But it was this mission in Chicago, like a soup kitchen, probably where they would have people who had come to Christ and had become solid and you know on fire for the Lord, who would come into their studio and record their stories, and then they would dramatize it with the music and this and make it. Oh, sound I think like... I remember hearing some of those. Yeah, yeah. but those they sound, would. Yeah. They would get you, you know, stuff like that between oh, yeah. the chick tracks and the pictures of, you know, here's hell with a great chasm and the people falling in and or the yeah. two paths, like this wide path to hell and this really narrow, teeny path yeah. To, yeah. to glory. And it's like those if you if you get the right personality in the right context, those will absolutely get you. And you're like, that's it. That is reality. Oh, yeah. That's that's my oh, yeah. worldview. So, oh, yeah. Sorry so, for the sidetrack there. Oh, no, that's interesting that you mentioned those. I remember I, I don't remember who did it, but I remember those those uh hearing those things on the radio about these stories from all these people with this you know back there in chicago and I, what's the name of that again uh, something about chicago mission or lighthouse yeah. mission or something but yeah, yeah from remember. family yeah. radio so yeah i would you know that's one other thing i did when i after that i mean i after i had this conversion i like 
you know, I was a huge Beatles fan. I just got rid of my Beatles records. Every, I, all the music, all it was all gone. All I was just focused on Christian music because, you know, all these people are just heathen. They're the world, blah, blah, blah. Just totally nut, you know, about it all. So, you know, I had this conversion when I was 20. And then I, and, you know, going to church every Sunday and all that stuff, visitation, handing out tracts, witnessing to people. And uh, at some point I said, well, what is this is real. What I can't just go the rest of my life just working as a carpenter, you know, and then you did, were you called to the ministry? At some point I felt like, I don't know if I was really called, you know, you hear that you're called to the ministry. And I, I guess I thought I, I thought I was, but I thought, well, this just makes sense. I'm, you know, I have the message of eternal salvation. I need to just devote my life totally to this. And so I decided I'm just going to go to Bible college. I'm going to become a preacher. And I, and I, it, I also thought, well, you know, we're so spoiled in the United States. Everybody here, everybody knows about this. If you don't, if you don't know about this, you're not paying attention and you don't care. I said, there are people all over the world that have never even heard. Yeah. I should go to them. You know, and so I had this, you know, there's a Wycliffe Bible translators. I remember hearing about them. I thought, I'm going to go to Bible College. I'm going to learn. I'm going to be a missionary. Get out of the United States and you know, go to people that are going to have never heard. You have to give them a chance, you know, because they're going to hell and they need Jesus. You know, these people have had their chance. You know, sort of that was my mentality. So then I went to, you know, I, it was a conservative. It was a, there's, it was called, well, there was a group of these super fundamentalist Baptist Bible Baptist Fellowship International. They're a King James only bunch, you know, and they had this little college down in California. They had another one in Missouri, I think. And uh, anyway, so there might have, I don't know if there was another one or not. But anyway, so I went to this one in California. I went down there to get my education, Bible college. Can I ask, did you get sucked into the King James only perspective at all? Oh, yeah. I mean, it was one of the chick tracks that had that in it you know yeah you know yeah king james only but then when i went to bible college you know and i you know my first semester you take your bibliology class and you see that um you know it's translation of the greek and and hebrew and and i remember looking think well it's just a translation but the, the whole college was still that way but there was one professor who actually he graduated from bob jones he was teaching the that's this theology class and he wasn't quite, I remember him, there was a little bit of a controversy going on about that because he wasn't so KJV only and he was, you know, who wasn't really pushing it, but he was, he let you know that, eh, there's, you know, a question about this. So I remember, so, you know, so I, I was open to it after that thinking, well, oh, this is, this is kind of crazy. This, it's just a translation, you know, hmm. what's up with this? You know, so this is one of those, you know, little things this doesn't quite fit. This doesn't make sense. And so, you know, and also, you know, learning you know, about you know, how it all came together, the, the different books were put together and, you know, the yeah. can, can, canonicity and all that. I, for anybody so, yeah, that, I was into it, but then I thought, well, it wouldn't take long for you to say, eh, you know, that's kind of crazy. For anybody that isn't familiar with the King James only perspective, uh, can you just give a summary of that real quick? Well, basically, they, they think that, you know, King James was sort of used by God, from my understanding, used by God to get these, to make a translation that's sort of anointed by God, and it's the translation. It was like the Texas Receptors is the right manuscript to be going by, and these other ones are wrong, you know, they've been corrupted, and, you know, it's like, so it's just the King James, and so they're, so it's not only is not using the King James Version that was supposedly anointed by God to be used for the English, which is silly, but you know they're not using the right manuscript, so the other manuscripts have been corrupted by God, by Satan, or whatever. You know, so yeah. you can't trust those. They're part so of if the... that's, I mean, you probably know more about that than I do. But well, a little, maybe a little bit. Um, but yeah, it's, I would just say, did it what you said, and it's 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 definitely the sense of like there's there's this liberal agenda in the world, oh, yeah. and instead of instead of attacking the Bible, which some of them do, they'll just say, oh, the Bible's bunk. It's you know, it's it's mythology. But others would wouldn't take that route. They would do this really like they wouldn't try to attack Christianity. They would try to join it and say, yeah. "Let's like let's make a liberal version of it. Let's take out yeah. a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but still leave you know eighty percent of it. And then a few years later, take out a few more and just this kind of gradual, um, like the slow boil of the frog picture. You know, like you just slowly get <clears throat> eventually you're, you're, there's nothing left in your Bible, and now yeah. you're now you're a liberal you know pro progressive Christian so to speak. And yeah. the, the the big th 
experience I had with that. I, I didn't have too much, although I was at Bob Jones. Um, and I remember hearing a little bit about the controversies that, you know, about some of the professors, the, the very respected Greek professors who, who publicly said, we are not supporting King James onlyism. Uh -huh. And I, I think there were a lot of King James only people who went there and who were like, maybe we should have been at Pensacola Christian College <laughs> instead. But, yeah. you know, they, Bob Jones was unapologetic about that, which was interesting. But by my personal experience was I, I had gone to, with my church in Philadelphia, I'd gone to this Baptist camp right on the border of Pennsylvania and Ohio. It was called Open, and we're there for a week. And um, I had made some some friends, but I'd actually made, met this girl that we ended up staying in touch and thinking about, you know, a, a, some kind of dating relationship, even though it was long, a little bit long distance. And I remember it being an issue very early on, like, wait, you're not King James only? Like, like yeah. this is an issue. Like, you know, you can't, I can't <laughs> date someone who's not King James only. <laughs> it's so weird. <laughs> <laughs> it's very weird, but there's also that sense of even if people aren't King James only, there's like this this aura of respect. Like if if you can, especially if you can pray like that, if you can you know you know everyone you know heads bowed, eyes closed. Lord, Thou art so mighty and amazing and glorious. Thou art this and Thou hast done this. Like if you could actually <laughs> speak like that as if it was your normal way of speaking. There was this yeah. aura about you, like, whoa, that's a real spiritual person. Yeah, and I remember thinking, weird. like, why are you talking like that? Like, it just sounds so weird to me. <laughs> yeah. But yet is. they would do it very, very, the, the people in oh, yeah. church that would do it, they, they wouldn't talk like that normally, of course. But yeah. the, the second they started praying, they prayed in King James only. <laughs> it's it was so crazy. cultic, you know, really. It's, yeah. Well, and yeah. I remember, you know, I remember too thinking, you know, other churches that were, not using King James, that they're corrupt, they're part of being corrupted by it all. And, you know, thinking these people probably, aren't, I mean, I was really bad. I was thinking these people probably aren't, half of them probably aren't even really saved or even 90%, you know, most of these people aren't even saved. They're just doing this stuff. They don't have a relationship with Jesus. They're just playing the game, you know? Yeah. So, you know, I was, and I even when I went to Bible college, I remember walking and talking to different people, I think, that, and people didn't have the same sort of experience that I had. I think, well, you weren't really saved, you know? I dated, I dated a girl that I, you know, that she didn't, had didn't, when I was in Bible college, and I think, I don't think you, I don't think you're really saved. I mean, you, when did you, did, you know, when did you supposedly accept Jesus? Did you feel like you were anointed, you know, the Holy Spirit entered you and, and made you a child of God and cleansed you of your sin? Well, I don't know, I just prayed and asked, well, you know, I remember really seriously doubting a lot of people's salvation, and, and the, you know, the, the sort of the King James thing was, sort of intertwine with that. Well, that's the people are, they're, they're being deceived. You know, they don't have the Holy Spirit showing them this. And that was another thing, you know, early on in Bible college thinking, okay, we all have the Holy Spirit. Why are we, there's so many different beliefs. I thought the Holy Spirit was guiding us all into the truth. And then you got people arguing about this, these little minutiae and subtleties and things. And shouldn't you just be able to pray and have the Holy Spirit show you and guide you through this? And so I was like, ah, something's wrong here. You know, that's one of the, another one of the early things that started making me question stuff. You know? Yeah. Can I ask you uh, before you go into that part of it, two, two quick questions. Um, number one, this idea of, you know, you need to make sure that people are saved, not just the, the clear pagans that don't know Christ, yeah. um, the atheists or whatever, the Jehovah's witnesses, but, even the people that are in your church, maybe standing next to you singing this, the hymns, we know that there are people who, you know, according to scripture, are going to say, Lord, Lord, we did this and that in your name. And he's going to say, oh, yeah. depart, depart from me. I never knew you. And so we are obligated to constantly be talking and thinking about the gospel, that we have to get the gospel, has to be the clear gospel, the gospel of grace. Yeah. And, you know, if you, you pick up these little spidey senses, like if, if they start weaving in works at all, even a little bit, I know they're not saved or if, if it, well, like you said, if, if I don't sense the, the spirit came in and just radically transformed their lives, they probably weren't saved unless yeah. they, you know, just one of those really weird ones where they just got saved, truly saved at five and never really had a chance to have a worldly life where it could truly yeah. look like night and day. But did you get that sense of like, I can't really, or, or there's no real reason to talk about too much more with, with anybody unless we get to the gospel like if you if you know you meet a pagan sure let's talk about the football game let's talk about the ice hockey game you watched you know the yeah what's what's going on with the stanley cup okay well let's get past that now and get to the important information which is of course the gospel oh yeah you know yeah. tell me about your job your family but gospel did you get that sense like did 
that other people's stories and perspectives really became kind of irrelevant in light of the fact that everything else is kind of fluff if you don't have the gospel right oh yeah yeah that's yeah it, it, it's weird you, it's, you don't even in some ways don't even really take interest in the what the so frivolity of their life what matters is the gospel is accepting jesus you know then, then then you can turn your life and you can make your life worth living all this is nonsense and a waste of time you know who cares about your job and well, okay okay yeah you could care about your job a little bit you know you do it you have to do something. But even that part of me, part of me, I was really judgmental. I just think you haven't really given your life to Christ. You know, you're just doing this job. You know, don't you realize that that's, that's a waste of time in a sense, because there's people going to hell. I mean, they're, mm -hmm. they're dying and going to hell every minute. And you're just out there going off and playing around, doing your fun stuff, your hobbies, and your, all this stuff, whatever you're doing, but you're not really devoted to Christ, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, I thought I sort of would, because, you know, I, I had a house. I sold it. I had a career. I gave it up. I just gave up everything to go do it. And so I, it was probably a certain amount of arrogance that went along with that, thinking, well, I'm doing what Jesus said to do, and you're not. You know. Yeah. So, Would you say then, it sounds like you're kind of alluding to this, but um, would you say that there was this sense of if you didn't preach, that their blood was kind of on your hands? Like you, you were at least semi-personal responsible that if God brought someone across your path, that you were responsible to find out where they were. And if they weren't, if it wasn't clear, you had to bring it to the gospel or if you right. chose not to, because like, Hey, I'm tired. I got, you know, I got to go home and just, you know, chill out and watch my favorite episodes or whatever that, that, that selfishness and that laziness was, even though you might make it to heaven, so to speak, because of Christ righteousness being righteousness, being the, the reason you would get to heaven at the same point in terms of rewards, and if there's any sense of regret that you could possibly have in heaven about what you had done or not done on earth, that you would deeply regret uh, to whatever extent you could in heaven, not having shared the gospel, that their blood was on your hands and that they're literally like they almost like this question of, you know, only God knows what they would have done with the gospel. But you, you know, not being God, you didn't know if the, if, if you had just opened your mouth and said, share what Christ did on the cross and with his death and resurrection, that maybe that would have been sufficient for them to connect the dots and say, yes, I need to bow my knees and, and accept Christ as my savior. And that your failure to do that was kind of like, it's as if someone was screaming in a house that was on fire saying, you know, Bill, can you please come? You know, there's a, there's a ladder right there. If you will just put that ladder up for 10 seconds, I will climb down it and be fine. And it was like, you said, sorry, I'm busy. I'm busy. Was yeah. that sense in your oh, worldview? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I thought about it a lot, you know. And I did, you know, I, I did witness to people. I probably was obnoxious at times. I'm sure I was, you know. And I, I can think of a particular guy that I worked with who um, was really rude to me one one time, and I couldn't figure it out. And then years ago, you know, I, I was talking to my dad and he knew him. And, and basically that's what I got back because I was just obnoxious pushing this stuff down his throat and he got tired of it, you know? And so he was, you know, brewed back to me, like, shut up, Bill. He didn't want to say that, but you know, he was, I don't remember the exact words and what his attitude at the time was. But I remember just, anyway, so yeah, I was, I was pretty obnoxious at times trying to tell people about the gospel and Jesus and things. And you know, sometimes I try to work it in there subtly, or sometimes I would just say it. So Hmm. Yeah, I felt like this was this was the truth. This is the you know the eternal truth of life. It's, it's all that really matters, you know. And so yeah, I would. And that's part of what you know. Being logical about it was like uh, logically, I need to go into the ministry and spend my life for this, and I need to tell people. Hmm. Yeah. So, and I would feel guilty, and I thought, well, okay, if they don't hear, then what's on me? But you know, then part of me is like, well, this isn't. I still had sort of this rational bit in my back of mind saying, well, that doesn't, it doesn't quite add up really, because how could they would go to hell because of me that, you know, that, how could that work? You know, so it doesn't make sense in some ways because they're going to hell because of their own, you know, I, I just had this logical contradictions that I was struggling with at different time, but I, I would just push them down and say, oh, you know, well that, you know, I can't understand everything. God's ways are you know, his ways and his thoughts are his thoughts and my thoughts are mine. And I'm just, just a sinner and I only have a part of the picture. So, and also the idea, well, the more I study and the more I learn, the more it'll all make sense and all start fitting together. You know? Yeah. So that's sort of, but yeah, I did. 
mm -hmm. feel responsible and guilty. It's interesting about the obnoxious part, because I think we all as Christians had a sense in which we would do that in various ways. I'm sure some of us were much more in your face about it, but um, like there's almost like a, there's a badge of, of glory, like, oh, yeah. like honor, yeah. like, 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 look, Christ is a stumbling block. If you are stumbling over this and you're offended at my message, <clears throat> you're not actually offended at me. I'm just the messenger. You're offended at the message of, of the yeah. gospel. So yeah. it's almost like if you're not offended, I may not be doing my job right. Like it's almost like, yes, you're offended at the gospel. I did it right. Cause you should be, yeah. you know, and th yeah. this is the dividing line. If you're offended, that means you're truly bucking, you know, you're fighting God, you're kicking against the pricks. And, um, you know, if, if you're, if you're, if God, if spirits warming you up, then this is the, 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 the watershed moment where you, you say, I reject myself and my sin and I turn to Christ. Otherwise, if you say, no, no, I reject Christ and I turn to keep going with my sin and myself, this is, this is God's way of basically showing you are clearly condemned. You have rejected his perfect, um, yeah. provision. And God makes it really clear. You're either for him or against him. You're either, you know, uh, for your, for, for Christ and the cross or you're for yourself yeah. and your sin. And it's, it's, it's interesting that there was this sense, I think for me growing up that if you, if everyone knows you're that guy, you're that guy that won't shut up about the gospel. What a, what a great, uh, proof of your, you know, the intensity that you, oh, yeah. this, you're, you are not a casual Christian. This is real. You're on fire for the Lord. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. You know, well, take us in. What happened next in your story? So, yeah. So then I went to, so let's see, I went to, so basically I started having some questions about the King James Version in this college. And so I, you know, it was, a, it was called Pacific Coast Baptist Bible College. And so taking more theology classes. And, and I remember being there and really struggling, just starting to see things that just weren't fitting, you know, like the King James only thing and, uh, you know, taking the bibliology class, realizing that, okay, these are just, these are Paul wrote letters and there are some that weren't included. Well, you know, I had no idea. I just thought, well, this, this is a perfect book. It just, I guess somehow in my mind, you don't think about it. It just magically put together. God put it together somehow and it's perfect. And so, you know, you start hearing about like, oh, first John five, seven, where the, tr the Trinity doctrine is inserted in there and they're, you know, manuscripts that are different. Uh, and I think well, God can't preserve. Why didn't God preserve his word? There's this, you know, so this thing started, you know, uh, yeah, there's like nine different, hmm? nine different endings of Mark out there. Well, yeah, stuff like that, you know, and so, <clears throat> um, so I, you know, I had a lot of struggle. I actually was pretty, in some points, pretty depressed in Bible college the first year because I was seeing these things and struggling and, and, uh, like between my like between my second and third year at that school, there was a there uh, there was a family that I had known who in the church here I was in Yakima, and they had moved down to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, not not no, Lancaster, Lancaster, California. And they were living there, and there was some guy from the school I was at who was became their pastor, and they said, "Well, why don't you come and help out?" So that summer I went there, and I became uh, like the music director and started a choir, and you know I'd sing. Uh, you know, solos, you know, the, how they have a solo thing and he, the pastor's wife would and every once in a while I'd have somebody in the church. It was a really small church, maybe like 50 people at the most. But so I got involved in this church and uh, um, with him. Did that during the summer. And then, then uh, you know, then my last year, I kept doing that, helping him out in this church. And I'm trying to think of what um, I was, I, I had this idea that God is going to take care of me financially or whatever, and I wasn't doing well financially, you know, I was hurting, you know, and I remember having, a, I don't remember exactly how I went, but I remember having a conversation with a pastor and about him talking about, why well, I just don't have enough faith and blah, blah, blah. And I think, what do you mean? I don't have, faith. I gave my life. I left everything. I think if I'm going to preach the gospel, God's going to provide for my needs you know, financially, whatever, you know, and I, I would, I had worked in the, I had worked mowing lawns and groundskeeping there at the college to make money. And also I played baseball. So I was on the baseball team and I got a partial scholarship for that. And so did that while I was there, but I still was coming up short. And anyway, it's like, why isn't God providing for my needs? You know, so this thing <clears throat> was getting to me. 
so that was just another issue that sort of got, there were other things that happened in the college that made me question a lot. Just like, like I said already, people, this arguing and bickering and doctrinal debates and stuff. And, and during this last year, I don't know how, I don't remember how it came up, but that's where I was introduced to John MacArthur Jr. And I remember reading some of his stuff, hearing him, I would hear him on the radio, you know, and I really liked it. I mean, the guy just, you know, he was a great Greek expositor or whatever. If you, you're probably familiar with him. Very. Great preacher, very persuasive, very, you know, he goes into stuff and just, he just holds your, you know, I learned a lot from listening to him. And so, you know, some of us wanted to go to his church and I was like, oh, that's a big controversy. He's a liberal, you know, John MacArthur Jr. is a liberal. Oh, give me a break. So, you know, some of us went to his church and there was a big controversy about that. And I think, well, what is the deal? You know, this guy, he's studying God's word. He's preaching. He's doing, you know, he's taught, he's still got the same salvation message and he's not King J KJV, but so this is just a huge mess, this whole thing. So people were telling you to, to try to discourage you from going to his church because he was too liberal, you're saying? Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's crazy. That's amazing. I, remember, I, I haven't I remember, heard that, but I, I could yeah. imagine the King James only person saying that, but that's pretty crazy. Oh, yeah. He is pretty pretty conservative compared to oh, most. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, I was like, by the end of the third year there, I was done. You know, They only had a three-year program. They didn't have a fourth year. And uh, I could have graduated, got an associate's degree. It was, not, it was uncred unaccredited college, so I mean, it didn't really matter. I still had the degree. I didn't go through graduation. I was kind of fed up. And so I left and I um, went back. To, like I said earlier, I went back to become a carpenter for a while. I said, I got to figure out what I'm going to do because this, this group here is nuts. You know, they're, they're too extreme. So I was, did a lot of reading. I did a lot of reading, um, you know, different types of books. Um, a lot of John MacArthur Jr. I liked him and um, i trying to think. Well, then I, would, I started looking at other schools. I looked at Multnomah School of the Bible. It's in Portland, Oregon. And I looked at uh, Moody Bible Institute. I thought, maybe I'll go there, finish up, get my degree. I was doing some looking at that. And then my a friend of mine, well, that's about the time John MacArthur Jr. I'm not sure how what happened, but he basically became the president of what used to be Los Angeles Baptist Bible College. And he, that's where he turned it into the master's university, yeah, master's college. And a friend of mine heard about it, and he went there. And he said, Bill, you got to come here. I said, okay, I'm coming. And so I went there. Um, I was all excited about that. This is John MacArthur. He was like a hero to me because I thought he was like the best. You know, I, I remember listening to, listening to Charles Swindoll. I really liked Charles Swindoll. I remember going to his church one and you know, it was, it was cool. You know, I went to, um, I actually went to, um, what's that, that Crystal Cathedral, Charles, what was the game? Crystal Cathedral guy. Chuck Schuler, is that who it was? It sounds anyway, similar, yeah. He's he's real he's a real liberal, but it was kind of, I went there, but I, I was opening up to actually um, Robert looking Schuller. at other people, not be so judgmental. So anyway, I went to John MacArthur's college, but before I did, I was actually I was really wanted to learn Greek, so I got the textbook and I just started studying Greek and teaching myself, hmm. and so I I went mid year into uh, the, the master's college and my friend had already taken the first semester of Greek and I was talking to him and looking I was getting ready to register and, and it saw what he had learned I said well I've already learned all this I, I said and so I went and talked to the Greek professor and I said could I just jump in here I think I can manage I think I've already gotten this stuff and he said oh sure so I jumped in second semester Greek you know and took that and then, you know, then I started learning Greek. And then this is where it really started. Um, the questions really started piling up. So I learned Greek. And I'm starting to see this amb amb so much ambiguity in the text. You know, people, things could be translated so many different ways and then interpreted differently. And I said, this isn't so clear. And hmm. somehow the question of hell started coming up and i said i kind of had to really dig into this hell so i looked in the greek and i actually taught myself hebrew too i got a hebrew text so i could read it you know i wasn't really good at it but you know i didn't take a class but i got a hebrew t uh, textbook and learned that so i could read some hebrew and was looking and i guess you don't really need to do that to do what i did but 
um, sort of motivation, but you can get a, a, court, uh, a concordance and do it. But I started doing a word study on Hades, Sheol, all this stuff. And I'm thinking, hold it. This is just the grave, you know, all through all, you know, from Adam and Eve, it says death, you know, and people die. And then all of a sudden it sort of starts to shift. This hell doctrine starts to shift in the New Testament era. And then and you have Revelation, which is figurative, saying that they're cast in a lake of fire. And blah. But most of all, even Jesus said uh, they to be destroyed and they will perish. So I was looking at all these Greek words and think, this does not say this. Hmm. This does not say people are tortured forever and ever. I, the Jehovah's Witnesses have it right. Seventh-day Adventists have it right. All these people, you know, 90 whatever percent of Christianity that says you you're, you're have a soul that lives on and it's tortured forever, or you go to hell or whatever, you know, there's different. So they're wrong. The Bible doesn't even teach this. And I'm like, I think, I think I'm going crazy. Dude, if I could add two thoughts to that real quick. Um, number one, it's interesting when you add what you're saying about how it changed. You can you can time it to the, the advent of the stories and influence of Zoroastrianism. When they yeah. got taken over by Persia, you know, Zoroastrianism had a very clear uh, final outcome where, you know, you're literally going to be purified with fire, so to speak. And it's it's going to be, you know, good or bad. But th this isn't it doesn't just end with you rotting as a corpse in the grave like there is a final judgment oh, yeah. as soon as they go to persia and they get zoroastrian influence sure enough you see it bringing coming in yeah. but then what's interesting too is even in the new testament you see words <coughs> from greek mythology like in um you know the first and second peter and jude i believe talks about tartarus like tartarus oh, yeah. they yeah. knew what tartarus was it had to do with greek mythology and underworld and you know they're pulling in terms straight out of greek greek myths greek poetry and for, for Christians to ignore that stuff and not tell you where it really came from is to me very disingenuous. Oh yeah. That's the thing. You know, you don't even know that they're not teaching you this in Bible college. You're, you're, you know, you have, if, if you want to find this information, mission, you got to go outside and get it someplace else, but they're not telling you all, even, even in, you know, the places where, well, of course, you know, you know, they don't tell you anything in church. Yeah. And when you get to, when you get to Bible college, you at least get some of the dirt but you don't get all of it. And so like you're talking, about, I didn't, he was totally unaware of that, that type of thing. I remember reading a few books on, uh, on Christian history or the his diff different, uh, there was one called, I can't remember what it was called. It was a book but basically about the history of Christianity or it, oh, his history in the Bible or something like that. And sometimes it alludes to some of those things, but, but they're not going to teach you that in Bible college. Yeah. But so, um, but I, but I was really una, even unaware of what you're talking about, the Zoroastrian, all this influence. I was just looking at the text itself saying, this text does not teach this. And so this is when, this is this was really the beginning of the major decline. This was in the, my last year at 88, where I was questioning. And so I think about this hell thing and I go, hmm, well, I am. You know, I remember thinking to myself, I have a brain. I need to use it. I should not be afraid to use my brain for logic, reason, and make this. I remember telling, and I remember telling people that, oh, look what I found. You know, some of my classmates and other people. I, I when I was there, I was working in the kitchen doing dishes, you know, and stuff, and helping and people I'd be working with talking about this. Oh, you're crazy. I said, what's the Greek? Oh, you learned Greek. You, you, you learned too much. You learn all this stuff, and it just confuses you. And I says, no, it doesn't confuse you. It's making sense. And and I had roommates that were thinking I was going nuts, you know. Well, well no, no. Well, I went to my Paul. This is this is what really gets me. This is what really threw me. Open my eyes. Another big, bigger eye opener was I uh was questioning this hell thing. And I would I had reached a conclusion through my own Greek studies, you know, through Hades Sheol, you know, Numa, Suke, and all these Greek and Hebrew words that in the context, it's just basically, you know, they like, even like soul, you know, it just means a life, you know, spirit just means breath or air, you know, it's just, this is so obvious. Well, I was pretty disturbed by all this. And I went to my apologetics teacher who was an ex Jehovah's witness. And I told him, I said, I'm having a struggle with this hell soul spirit deal. Um, do you have any suggestions? What do you, he said, well, I can suggest two books for you. One was, uh, 
some some I can't remember who the author of it was. It's been a long time. It was basically it was the conventional like Geisler or Gleason or something like that. I remember her name wrote this book about you, and it was actually in a response to this conditionalist position. And he gave me this other book. It's uh, the the fire that consumes. It was uh, I don't know if you ever heard of that book. It sounds familiar. I don't remember if I read basically it's this guy. His, his name was. Uh, Edward Fudge, who had been a okay. fundamental um, sort of Christian guy, and he did his doctoral thesis on hell. Hmm. And uh, he wrote this book. And anyway, my apologetics professor suggested these two books. He said, one's the conventional position, one's the the you know conditionalist position. I said, okay, I'll get them. So I got the got the books, read the one. I didn't even get through the first one on the traditional position. I said, this is garbage. He's just blathering on. There's no depth. There's no content here. He's just he's just doing a he's just he's arguing for position that's that's is is not defensible. It's kind of what I got. It's not, yeah. This doesn't even make sense. So then I got the other book and I read through it. And it's like everything that I had seen on my own personal study was right there. He because this um, Fudge guy he had written the book and he had changed his position through his studies. Hmm. and written this book it's a if you ever have anybody who wants to really learn about the whole hell doctrine and stuff get, that's a good book is it more of a the outcome is more of an annihilationist perspective yeah or what? Okay. basically yeah still he's still you know he's still a bible believer and and held this position it's interesting that 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 doctrine of hell is for many people it's almost as equivalent in in importance as the gospel itself like oh, if yeah. you don't believe yeah. in hell then you don't believe in the Bible. So what's you know, like? What else are you going to deconstruct next? Like, okay, maybe the blood atonement isn't real. Uh, yeah. Whatever it is, you know, they're, they're, that is a hill you have to die on. That the hell is real, and it's really a fire, and it really goes on forever. And there yeah. really are people who are going to be there forever. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting that that is that is one of the critical. Even though you know, some people say no, no. Well, it's more more about the virgin birth, the resurrection, you know, death and resurrection yeah. of Christ, blood atonement, but. I think the the idea is that if if you don't have uh, a carrot and a stick, you know, you don't have this stick of hell that's going to whip you. If you don't have this fear factor, then what do you need Jesus for? Like if if yeah. you if you're not in grave danger for all eternity, if you can just kind of live your life without Christ and then just kind of boop become nothing, yeah. then there's no real. You don't really need the gospel. You, yeah. you, I mean, you, you might you might want it for to live the best life now, so to speak where you're truly giving glory to God. But if the worst that can happen to you is you fall asleep and that's yeah. it, like what's, what, what do you need yeah. the gospel? What's, what's the big deal? fear factor, you know? Yeah. And that's really, really telling because you know, that's what I started seeing is it's not about what the Bible says. It's just about dogma. It's just about doctrines. You don't care if it's really supported, you know, by the, it's all emotional. You know, we have, we have, we have this, this dogma we have to push. And if you buck that, you know, you're, you're, you're bucking the whole system. Yeah. yeah so fear, fear and control. Yeah. And so I read the book fire that consumes and said, this guy is spot on. He had some more information, some historical things that I was unaware of. And so you, you alluded to, you know, some love it come from other religions, Zoroastrianism and stuff like that. And the Persians. And, and so I said, but I just said, this is it. This is okay. Now what am I going to do? I'm studying to be a minister. I don't believe in hell, not the, the conventional. I believe when you die, you're dead. So anyway, go back to my apologetic professor. So I take these, I go back to him. I says, you know, I read these books and I'm pretty convinced that um, Fudge's book is right. Annihilation and conditional immortality. I'm pretty, and he said, what did you think of it? And he goes, well, I never read them. I said, what? You're suggesting books you never read. That you, you're an apologetics teacher. What do you think? And I was, I was like shocked. I said, here's a guy teaching people. He, he's just pushing dogma. He's not teaching the Bible. He, he, and so, and I remember, then I remember going to my, my pastor here in town and I was like on spring break or something. Maybe it was, but anyway, I went to him and said, you know, I'm not believing in hell anymore. 
well, what do you think? And he goes, well, you know, I've never really studied it out myself. I just kind of believe what, you know, the dogma that was, that was been taught when I learned. And he says, and so he copies a bunch of pages out of a theology book and hands them to me. I said, this guy's teaching other people the Bible and he doesn't even know what, what's going on here. All these people teach other people and they're clueless. They're, they, they're just basically, they, they, I started realizing they've just absorbed stuff, the dogma, the doctrines. They've just absorbed it. They went to Bible college. They got their degree. They went through their classes. They're not really studying the Bible. They're just studying theology. Yeah. And that's all so, really before, like, all that you're saying is really before you even bring in a whole bunch of other topics, which I'm, I'm sure you've gotten into as well, but like, what were the church councils saying over the next several hundred years as they oh, fought? Yeah. But like, you know, what were, why is it that orthodoxy changed so much oh, yeah. over the yeah. centuries? And it's like, you, you know, you, you're just talking about the Greek differences, but there is all kinds of other issues that just compound. And eventually you realize this number one sounds very man-made, like literally yeah. <laughs> man, made up by men, not women, but man-made. And it sounds like it's evolved which is ironic because these people are usually against evolution. This evolved yeah. repeatedly and the whole structure of it looks like it was even intimidated by political reasons, not necessarily just purely uh -huh. religious church reasons. There were po politics within the church, but politicians outside making decisions with the church leaders. You're like, wait a second. Like yeah. this, this does not sound divine anymore. Like this, and at this, all. No. And what, once yeah. you start to realize that, you also you're clued in. You're like, I'll bet there's a lot more here than I even know. Like I, yeah. I know I now well, know five or ten major issues. I bet there's a lot more because this is it, it. Trains your mind to see there's something else going on here. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, you start seeing that. You know, like this is what happens. So you have a little crack. And you go, hold it. This isn't right. And you start you start heading down that crack, and you start seeing more cracks. You know, and so that's sort of what happened. Then I remember, then I took this book to my Greek professor and I said, I'm not believing this stuff. You know, what is he, what do you think of this book? You know, he's talking about the Greek and the, and basically he just gave me the same line. Well, I never really studied this out, this topic out myself. And I'm thinking, geez, the, this is like a, a pillar of the whole message is that you're going to hell if you don't accept Jesus. And then you've never really studied this and it's not even in the Bible. I said, this is crazy. I mean, I still believe the gospel. I still believe that Jesus Christ died for our sins and all that, but I'm thinking, but all these people are wrong about this. And though the people that they, the couple of groups that they call cultic, Jehovah's Witnesses, and Seventh-day Adventists, they're right. And they they call them cults, you know, you know, for varying degrees. So I'm going, okay, this is, this is nuts. And so I graduated and I was pretty disillusioned. This is an 88. So I said, I'm just going to sit out. I'm going to try to figure out what I'm going to do next. And so I did a lot more reading and research and stuff. And I, I, I applied to a seminary in British Columbia, Regent College, I was accepted. And then I, and I, and I, before I went, I just said, no, I'm just not sure this is what, I'm not sure what's going on. I, I don't want to go up there and do this again. Go to school and be disillusioned and figure. So I just dug in some more, just started studying more. And, and at some point I decided, you know, I'm going to, I'm just going to go through, I know, I know Greek. I'm just going to go through the New Testament in Greek on my own, just studying it, you know, have a commentary to, you know, help it. But I'm going to read it through. So I started in the book of Matthew. I started going through Matthew verse by verse. And right away you start saying, saying, this is what happened according to what the prophet said, blah, blah, blah. And so I go, okay, let's go back and see what the prophet said. And I started seeing that all these verses are pulled out of context. So what? Out of Egypt, that is Hosea 11, 1, that has nothing to do with Jesus. It's not even a prophecy. He just quotes this narrative about, about you know, God leading Israel, his son out of Egypt and then Matthew quotes it as a prophecy of Jesus. That isn't even a prophecy. What are you talking about? Yeah. So I just started going through, you know, Isaiah 7, 14, you know, the virgin. Well, no, this isn't. This is, the word is a young woman. He, he quotes a, the Greek Septuagint, virgin, and it doesn't even mean that. In context, he's just talking about a young woman and a boy is assigned to King Ahaz. This isn't prophecy. And so, you know, I go through doing all these things. I think this is a joke. This isn't, this is 
what is going on here? This isn't, this is a, Matthew basically is making this up. Yeah. Well, you know, so. And there's other side, there's other, other prophets, prophetic passages that they could have easily used that they completely ignore. Um, it's, it's, yeah. it's like both that both sides of it. It's, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So anyways, that's about the time, you know, I, I mentioned to you earlier where I, I got reunited with a, a friend from Bible college and we started, I'd have a real short courtship. I met her like, re-met her, re-acquainted re with her like in a, it was like in the, like August or September. And then we dated a couple months and we know each other. Let's get married. You know, this is God bringing us together. And then, so we got engaged like on uh, Thanksgiving and she wanted to be married on, on uh, February 14th, you know, okay. Well, you know, that's only a couple months, you know, two and a half months away. What is that? June, September. Yeah. Whatever that is, which is pretty quick and short. And anyway, so we're courting and I'm starting to see things. I said, Hold it. Maybe God didn't bring us together. You know, maybe I'm, I'm seeing some incompatibilities here. I'm, I'm not so sure about this. And I remember, and, but at the same time, this I'm kind of melding two stories together. I was questioning you know, God's guidance in some ways. But also I was telling her, so I don't even know, I was just telling her about this Matthew thing. I just, I said, I don't even know if I believe this. This is, I mean, this is Matthew's saying things that he's doesn't, he's pulling things out of context. It looks like this whole story is made up. And so, you know, a lot of the things are going on. This is all stuff juggling around in my brain. And then we ended up getting married. And then shortly after, like, I don't believe this anymore. You know, I mean, I don't know, maybe a, with a month or so afterwards. And she like just breaks down bawling, you know, just, oh, no. Well, she's married. To, she's married to Nathan. Married to heathen. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, her, her dad had been an, an ex, he had been a Baptist Bible fellowship preacher for years. Hmm. And then he left when she was a little girl, when she was younger. And her, her, her dad and wife, mother had divorced and he became a psychotherapist, a psychologist, counselor. Hmm. So I was talking to him. Do you know if he was still a believer? He wasn't a believer. I was. Oh, so he, I mean, he, had, he had left the faith. Well, he had left years ago, like 20, 30 years ago, prior. Wow. But he'd become a therapist. So he knew what I was going through. So I started having conversations with him. And I remember, you know, I remember talking to him and saying, well, what about Jesus? He says, I don't even think about Jesus. I go, what? You don't even, you don't even think about Jesus? It just seems so weird, you know? Not think about Jesus, and I was like, Ugh. you know. So I, you know, so I made this long story, which was shortened up with not too much personal detail. We ended up getting a divorce because I just realized that um, this was not a match. I this was it was silly to even do this in the first place because I was just thinking, oh, God brought us together, you know, you know, we're both Christians and we're both, you know been devout and all this stuff you know, we're virgins you know that's another thing you know i all this time growing up I just you know, think i gotta keep my pill pure till i get married and so we both did done that came together you know but um so you, you you take all these little bits and pieces of nonsense that you thought were reality and that mattered and you make decisions in your life according to this stuff and it's just it ended up blowing up in your face a lot of times so anyway, so we got a divorce and then I just said, okay, I'm done with this. And I just started. So then I started reading um, and then I, then I said, okay, I still believe in God. I, I really don't think that the gospel is true. I, so I started, you know, I read the Quran, read it front, front to back, the whole thing and thought this is just like, uh, like he just, plagiarized a lot of the Bible stuff, you know, and made up a bunch of nonsense. Okay, whatever. And there's a bunch of pretty bizarre and horrendous stuff in there. Then I read the Bhagavad Gita, and then I read the teachings of Buddha, I read Confucius, um, Tao Te Ching. I really like the Tao Te Ching. So I like the teachings of Buddha too. And, and Confucius, it's saying that all this is just men 
coming up with philosophies, trying to make sense of things. And nobody knows. They're all just, it's all man guessing. Yeah. And I started going to a, a, unit, a unity church and they started studying this course in miracles. I don't know if you've heard of that, but yeah. it's a, started studying that with some people and a lot, quite a few of the people there were ex-Christians and, you know, just sort of transitioning or have, had been that way. This, they fell into that and they stayed there. I was more trans transitioning. So I studied that a lot, and, but it, that became too Christian eaten for me, you know, Jesus and the Holy spirit. I think this is, uh, uh, yeah. I, and I, so. I've often wanna, thought about that as like for a lot of people, not everybody, but progressive Christianity or, or the ultra liberal stuff is it's like, if there's a, a train with a whole bunch of stops and the last stop is atheism for a lot of people, like the last stop before the stop of atheism, the, the penultimate stop is liberal Christianity, just because yeah. it, 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 it hurts so much to wrap your mind around. Well, there, there has to at least be an afterlife of some kind. Yeah. There has yeah, to, you know, there has to be a reason that there's something rather than nothing. Yeah. There has to be a, a starting point of a prime mover, something there has to be. And so yeah. you, 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 and it's like, you, it's like the cling, like I'm not getting yeah. on that train to get to the last stop yet. Like I have to stay here for a while and it's, it's hard. I mean, I, I get yeah. it. It's, it's very hard it's to, hard to give around. up, you know? Yeah. I mean, I was reading all kinds of that sort of new age type of books and things, trying to figure all this out, you know, and I was reading a lot of psychology too. Well, that's, you know, that goes back to another, another element of my deconversion that, I haven't mentioned because when I when I was still into it, I remember picking up The Road Less Traveled, uh, M. Scott Peck. I remember reading yeah. that book and thought, this makes sense. You know, this is, and, and I was reading and I think, and just this, what stuff is, what psychology is saying about our brains and human behavior makes a lot more sense in this Bible stuff. You know, it just, and, and, I, and I actually, and I was reading, I picked up some Christian psychology type books too. And I think, well, the psychology stuff makes more sense. Um, you know, you know um, your development as a child and how you be, believe, pick up beliefs and you assimilate them and your the trauma and the harm and the hurt that gets put on you that you work out and you play out on other people. And, the, and I remember reading, uh, there's a Christian psychologist who had written several books, um, Larry Crabb. I remember reading several of his books and thinking, yeah, this makes sense. Uh, he, he, the book called Inside Out was the name of the book. Basically, I've, I've read that cha book, yeah. changing from the inside out. I think it, this is this is it. I mean, you have to deal with psychological problems, and you have to deal with you know what harm has been done to you. Undo that. Learn. Grow up. You know, if you read it, you kind of. Of course, that was 30, 40 years ago for me. Whatever that was, thirty years ago. But, you know, so I think, OK, I'm reading all this, even Christian psychology stuff and thinking this makes a whole lot more sense, a whole lot more helpful than just, you know, just just give it to Jesus. Just pray and Jesus will take it away. You know, God will take care of it. And I think this is no, this is nonsense. And, you know, another thing that that I, you know, the judgment, the judgment in churches was just horrible. And I was part of it, too. But I, I dated this other woman, you know. In between, sort of, and towards the end of my Christian years, where she was divorced, and she got a lot of judgment and shunning from other people. You know, all these couples that are in the, in the church, they're all together, they stayed together, blah blah. And so there's this judgment, and it's also a self judgment that comes because I'm failure. I didn't. God, for some reason, didn't bless me. You know, so this all this stuff goes on. It's just it's horrible. Yeah. So. I started seeing that and thinking, oh, this is, this is messed up, you know? So here we are, it's supposed to be, you know, as Christians, we're supposed to, supposed to be connected to the eternal wisdom of the universe, the creator who knows all, you know, and we're supposed to have a relationship with him, but this is just a big mess that's going on in all this stuff. There's, it's, it's chaos. Yeah. It's hypocrisy. It's just judgment. And uh, I'm not seeing that there's a, there's anything special going on here other than just gathering around and playing make make believe together. You know, it's yeah. 
So anyway, so that was sort of. I would do that uh, and just say that another way of putting it too is, if this has so much power, you know, the gospel has power to transform lives. The gospel has power where the you know the joy of the Lord will be your strength. The word of the Lord will not go out um, and, and be empty. It will go out and accomplish what God has, has asked it to do. Like, why is it that it looks so, as you talked about earlier, so confusing, but also so powerless? Like, I remember, you know, I've, I've got people in my life that I know that they have listened to preachers preach sermons, you know, three or four times a day where they'll just, they've, you know, click on that Christian radio for breakfast, click it on for lunch, click it on for dinner. They, they listen to sermons hours and hours and hours a week they're in their bibles they're in their churches and they're some of the most cantankerous oh, yeah. nasty bitter people i've ever met i'm like oh, yeah where's yeah. the power and i i yeah. never felt it like I, yeah. I i i know i love jesus i know that was real but i never felt this strong power and then i think it really it nails people nails the coffin shut a lot when you get into um, purity culture you know where you you basically become this whole Jekyll and Hyde thing where you, you want to keep your mind pure. Like you say, you know, to, 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 to keep your virginity for sure, if you can, but to even go beyond it to more of an emotional virginity where you're like, I don't even want to disobey God and, and give in to temptation. And yet there's part of you that wants to. And so you have this constant back and forth, like I want to, and it, you know, it, clearly it's, it's, you know, that they would have an answer for it. Well, that you're talking about, you know, Romans six, seven, eight, that's exactly what Paul says. You, you know, the, the spirit's going to fight the flesh. But yeah. you're like, well, wait a second. Where's the, but where's the power though? If if I'm supposed to be experiencing the power of the Lord and the Spirit's going to overtake my flesh, and if I dwell on Him, I'm going to just feel the Lord transforming my mind. You know, Romans twelve one yeah. and two. You know, th th God is going to transform my mind. Well, yeah. where's where's the transformation? Yeah. Um, because I, I feel like I still want to do this and do that. And it, it over and over to me, it, it struck me the same way. Like there is, there is no power here. This, this, yeah. the, the power. And it, if there, if there is anything that looks like power, this could be explained as human willpower, yeah. cultural uh, pressure, like everyone's doing it. So I want to do it. Um, fear of being ostracized, of having the scarlet letter, anything yeah. like that. You add that stuff up and you can explain almost all of it away is that this is human power. This is not divine yeah. power. It's all psychological. You yeah, know, it, exactly. all of it is. It totally is. And it, you know, I have, I get a, I'm on in different debate groups, religious debate groups, and go back and forth. And you see some of these obnoxious sort of Christians, like I used to be sort of, and, and like they are, and like say that I try to tell them, you know, this is just, this, all this stuff you're, you're saying is, it's easily explained psychologically. You know, they, even the, you know, the experience of accepting Christ and this, this, oh, you, you were, it's the power of persuasion, the power of, you know, a belief that causes all this stuff. And so, and, but yeah, it's all psychology can pretty, it's pretty much explain it all if you're willing to listen, but they don't, they don't want to listen because they're stuck, they're trapped in this, you know, this um, God's, you know, the, the salvation, you're separated from God and need Jesus and that's it, you know? So there, like there was, um, I was having a conversation with somebody recently about, uh, well, the, the whole idea of free will, you know, that we make a choice. Well, you just chose not, I get this all the time. You just chose to not believe in him. No, I did not choose anything. I just, only thing you can choose is I'm going to choose to learn. I'm going to choose to be open. I'm going to choose to um, be rational and think about things. And, and, and if I, if I, if something comes along that shows me I'm wrong, I can, I can just choose. Well, you can't really choose because even if you've shown wrong then you know, you're wrong, you don't even choose it. You just have to go with it. But I said, I just choose to learn. I just choose to be open. And, but they have this locked in their brain that Adam and Eve, they chose to disobey God and all the way through the Bible, it's all about choice and choosing between good and evil, choosing between good all the way through to the end, you know, in revelation, they chose to, you know, chose to reject God or they chose to go to hell. There's no choice involved in this. And I mean, if you understand anything about psychology, you realize that there's no choice. You're just raised as a child to believe a bunch of things. You think it's true. It's all stuffed in your head. And basically more of it just gets piled on. And so you can either choose to question and learn, or you can just choose to stay stuck. That's the only choice you have. Yeah. But even that's hard because, you know, there's such a subconscious emotional element that's just 
has you imprisoned that's beyond somewhat beyond your control i mean there's a little bit of choice in there but it's all it's so suppressed by this fear factor i'm afraid to even think i'm afraid to even question or i'm afraid to learn because this could mean well you mentioned earlier it's mean i go to hell if i if i'm wrong and i'm scared sure, to in, learn in this in this life for sure you're you're going to get ostracized if you ask the if oh, you either yeah. ask the wrong questions or you take it to the wrong conclusion you know wrong according yeah. to the party line like you know yeah. you you can't go but too far in certain directions before you either have to pull yourself back to orthodoxy or people are oh, yeah. going to start to say you are maybe not a christian and and All as right. much as you'd hope and expect it they'd be like oh well if you're not a christian then i know my responsibility as a christian is to help you who is apparently not a christian i thought you were but you're not is to bring you back into the fold but oh, yeah. instead you become a traitor because you you it's like in hebrews i think it talks about you know once you've known it and walked away there's no more sacrifice for sins yeah. and and like you're, you're pretty much you know, there's nothing I can do for you now because I can't yeah. preach you the gospel because you know it maybe better than I do. You can preach it to yourself. If you've yeah. rejected the gospel that you know so well, yeah. you're basically now a traitor. Um, you're yeah. a traitor and you're become an enemy of the cross of Christ. You've made your life shipwreck. Yeah. And I now need to protect the flock from you. And you you put that context on people. It's yeah. really hard to walk away. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a scary thing. And I've got that from, you know, people all year. You, Satan, I remember getting that. Satan got you. Satan got you, man. I said, oh, no. Or they come to they come to you and try to talk to you. So I'm just trying to, well, one guy, what did he say? I can't remember. He says, I'm trying to, anyway, he's just trying to, you know, bring me back, you know, whatever. I can't remember the term he used. Like, oh, really? You know, dude, you don't really care about me. All I care about is my soul, whatever, you know. And they don't, they just don't get it that uh, it's not a choice. It, I didn't choose this. I didn't choose to believe this. I mean, I didn't choose to reject it. I was just, I was actually sincerely pursuing the truth and facts just kept slapping me in the face. You know, I, I can't, I'm going to follow the truth wherever it goes. I'm going to be intellectually honest. And uh, if I have a good argument, I'm going to say it's a good argument. If it's a bad argument. I'm going to say it's a bad argument. And so that's yep. what I did. And you know, people, you know, I get them all the time. People, oh, poor, poor Bill. He, he's lost. What's well, amazing. Chose, you like you can't un like the stuff you're talking about you can't unsee it it's like oh, yeah like for me if, if someone said tim what would it take for you to become a christian again like what, just what would it take yeah. how how can you how, what possible you know iteration of reality would bring you back to the lord to the church to the gospel to salvation what would it take and it's like I can't unsee what I've seen. I have yeah. seen the structure of the Zodiac in the Gospel of Mark. Yeah. I've seen them copy Homer in Luke and Acts, uh, you know, yeah. over and over and over. I've seen them copy from Euripides, from the Bacchae. I've seen them copy Virgil. I've seen them copy yeah. Plato. I've seen them copy Pythagoras. Like, this isn't a divine book. I can't, no. I yeah, can't, it's, it's like, you might as well ask me to say, you might as well rephrase it and say, what would it take for you to believe in Zeus? Like, what would yeah. it take? I'm like, it's not going to happen. I'm not going to yeah. believe in Zeus under any circumstances. Yeah. This is mythology and I've seen it. And, and it's, it's amazing to me to, to maybe, to, and, and what I'm trying to say this way is there is no scope for the imagination that they have to say, maybe this could have happened and started. Maybe the origin of this religion could have happened differently than, than they thought. Like the yeah. party line is, is it, this is, you know, obviously God did it and, but God did it through holy men that he spoke to and these things happen in history, but the whole idea that there were other stories going around completely separate from Christianity, that some of the early, you know, writers of this, you know, these gospels and stuff that they saw them and said, well, Homer says this, you know, this, this, this religion, you know, Mithras, the Mithras, Mithras religion says this, the Asclepius cult says this, we're going to borrow from it in some cases, or we're going to respond to it and kind of take their story and just flip it and have it as be a different outcome. And then we're going to put that in our story. Like they have no scope to even like, it seems weird to me, but most Christians are not saying you're wrong. He's not copying from Homer. They're saying, I don't want to hear it. Like I'm not oh, even yeah. open to the discussion. I'm not going to debunk this idea that Homer's woven into the gospels and acts. 
I'm just not even going to start the conversation because I know that I know that I know that I know that that's yeah. not what God did. Yeah. Oh yeah. And yeah, it's, it's a, the closed mindedness, I guess is what I'm getting at. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's scary. It's scary to me to think this, this, and that's where, where this is like, this isn't a religion. This is a cult. Your yeah, mind is, is completely shut off. And they hate it when you say that too. I, I always say I escaped the cult. Oh, it's not a cult. Well, yeah, it is. Sorry. Well, it's the cult's a small group of what? No. Well, how do you think Christianity started out? Yeah. A small group. Just because it got huge doesn't mean it's not a cult. Doesn't even mean it is the same mentality. Yes. Yeah, they're just they don't want to they don't want to learn. That's the thing, you know. And, and I can't unlearn what I learned. I can't, you know, like you say, I, I could not, there is no way I could go back and believe it. I can't unlearn facts. There are facts that are undeniable that just blow it away. And you try to you try to yeah. try to persuade people and get them to see that. And it's they just deny it. They don't want to see it. And, and a lot of this, like you're talking about, because you've gone into it a lot more than I have, because you know, I wasn't aware of some of the I remember hearing about the zodiac type stuff, you know, like the you know, the seven tribes of Israel, and you got the seven apostles and or not seven, twelve and twelve, you know, then that stuff. Hearing some of it, but there are certain facts that are undeniable. Or I guess what I'm getting at is, I think part of it is that you and I, and a lot of people that leave have more of a critical thinking sort sort of mentality, and you, and you sort of enjoy learning about details. I think a lot of people they don't really care about the details. It doesn't matter to them. It's to them, it's, and it takes some work. It takes a lot of you know. It's like studying Greek. You know, it took a lot of work to learn that and get into it and start paying attention to words. And what they mean and context and and be critical you know use critical thinking to think about what's a see oh, another thing to see all the ambiguity into it and and, and be honest that there's there yeah I'm kind of rambling but but yeah we we we're concerned about facts and details and a lot of people aren't they just, i don't care i remember one time when i was questioning prophecy you know, because I went from this you know, seven seven year tribulation pre trib rapture thing to it, towards the end, I was like a, a, a preterist, all millennialist. But I remember talking to some of my Christian friends, saying, "Well, this is, you know, this doesn't make sense. This is, you know, talk." And this one guy, who, I worked for a construction company, and mostly everybody there was Christians. I was talking to this guy, and he said, "Bill, I have a family to raise. I don't have time for this." It doesn't matter to me, really. You know, I'm doing, I'm thinking, yeah, that's true. And I, my boss was a Christian and I was telling him different things I was learning. And he says, oh, you just keep changing your beliefs. I said, yeah, because I'm learning. I'm just not stuck in a rut. But they don't, they see a change in beliefs as some, somehow a bad thing, or they don't want to take the time or doesn't, don't think it's important to learn and grow. They, they got the basics. I got Jesus. I got my wife and kids. I got the church. I go to choir or sing in church or listen to the preacher it's all fine everything's great you know yep. they're just <laughs> and call it lukewarm christian you know that's what it is you know yep. and so you're basically playing out the the warnings that's are in your own your own book you know you're acting it all out and not even realize it you're just a hypocrite i mean i hate to say that word but it really it is yeah uh, it's yeah. very, very true. It's yeah, it's and it's all basically it boils down to even more simply. It's like this is about the blood. I'm, I'm I plead the blood. The blood yeah. of Christ saves me. His death and resurrection covers me. I'm sealed for the day of redemption. Like that's yeah. it. Like I don't need much more than to know that I'm right with God through Jesus and the story. Yeah. And yeah, but the yeah. more you add to it, you're like you're changing it. You're changing the story. And that yeah. I think the existential threat of like maybe this isn't real. That yeah. is so. Yeah. I mean, I know for me. That was what was probably the most jarring, and it was it was right here oh, at yeah. this computer almost almost two years ago exactly. But um, like it just hit me. I studied it for about eighteen months. I was I was digging so deep into some of these topics, and after eighteen months, I just sat here, and I was like, it was like I was talking to myself, you know, as you do, just kind of talking through it, and I was like. I don't think this is real. Is that even possible? Could this? Isn't that bizarre? Could yeah. this? Could this be not real? Like, no, that can't. No, yeah. How could I have been so dumb? <laughs> yeah, but then you're like, you're like, no, no. I, I can see how this could have actually been a truly human story that evolved. Huh? You know, you know. There, there's oh, we yeah. know there's forty or fifty gospels. There's at least six books of Acts. You know, there's all these other stories woven in. You're like, I can see how this actually evolved. Is like you said, just a small cult. That just got yeah. institutionalized and grew and grew and grew and the state came in with constantine you know after a couple of centuries and like all of a sudden 
this little cult became huge and it just yeah. kept growing. And certainly, you know, that you could argue human nature wants, wants to see something better with life. Like we yearn for yeah. beauty, beauty. We yearn for justice. We would love to see all the wrongs made right. And so you have some kind of mythology that gets institutionalized and, and just, you know, globalized. It says, yes, you're right. There is a reason that you want justice. There is a reason you, you yearn for another world. It's because there is another world. You're made for that. And yeah. then, you know, you get all the way from the, you know, early days up, you know, from um, uh, Augustine all the way up to, you know, C.S. Lewis saying this stuff, you know, you are made for a bigger reason. And of course, like it makes sense. And so, and to actually question the very basics of it and say, it sounds good. It sounds lovely in some ways, apart from the people burning in hell, but you know, it sounds lovely to think God's going to make everything right. And there's going to be a beautiful heaven waiting for me. Yeah. But to say, what if, what if this is wrong? If, if it's wrong, then you've literally, number one, if you're a teacher of it, you've just, you've used your life to deceive other people. Yeah. And number yeah. two, even if you haven't been a teacher of it, you have literally wasted your life with blinders on scales over your eyes and you've never woken up. You have one life to live and you have never lived a day of it. Yeah. Not even once. Yeah. And that's, that's a frightening thought to me for so many people. Oh yeah. It's uh yeah, it was frightening. It was pretty disturbing. I still I go through spells where I think, geez, I wasted the first 33 years of my life. You know, I mean, I, I've seen, you know, other stories you see in the forties and fifties and Ditto. There's Tim Sledge. I don't know. Do you have who do you have you interviewed Tim Sledge? Not yet. Yeah, no, I, I do hope to soon. Oh, I just recently ran into him. And I think, man, that guy. He was in his fifties or something, and or maybe later than I think. And just recently, I don't know how I remember how recently, but left. I think. Wow, geez. But you know, I, I yeah, I I, I uh, grieve at times over thinking, what could my life have been like if I hadn't wasted all that time. But then I, I do look and I think, well, you know, I have this base of knowledge that I can, you know, I understand it and I can sort of use it to help, you know, open some other people's eyes the best I can. But that's all I can do. I, I was out of my control. There was nothing I could do about it. You know, I pretty much I was dealt this deck of cards from my parents and and the uh, people that I looked up to and respected, you know, as preachers and things oh they know the truth they know the truth they got it all together and i just follow them you know he's just a follower but to go to bible college and say hold it these guys are just admitting to me that they've never studied it they're just admitting it they just went through and got their degree and moved on and they're just spreading the rumors you know it's just yeah. it's crazy, crazy. But, well you're you're touching on what, where i wanted to wrap us up with and this is kind of the the question i go to in a lot of my interviews is the, the end state of all this. Uh, so number one, could I ask, what was it like after you deconverted and maybe the, you know, the last few weeks, days, whatever, where you finally switched, like, was there a day or an hour where it just like flipped as it was for me? Or was it like, just like you looked back and after six months and said, wow, I think six months ago, I probably started to deconvert and what it, whenever it was, I definitely deconverted. And then what has it been like since? And, and maybe in terms of the healing, like, how do you heal? And reclaim your identity when you've gone through this well sort of like i had mentioned it was sort of a slow process of awakening but then i think when i <clears throat> i don't remember exactly the day or but i do remember a day where it, it just dawned on me I think it's when it, I, everything came together. The main thing was what I mentioned about all of Matthew's prophecies just being a fraud. I think Matthew just wrote, you know, this is, he just wrote this up. He, he pulled these out of account. He made up a story. He made it up. Yeah. And I'll just add, we don't even know who, uh, who it was. Yeah, it wasn't. Yeah, right. True. <laughs> and so I said, you know, and, and I had to, you know, all this background of all this stuff. And it just, this is all fake. And then I just remember thinking, I don't believe this anymore. And that's when I went. So I remember just going, I said, this is scary. I don't believe this anymore. What am I going to do? Well, I can remember that it being in my living room, thinking that. And I don't remember for sure if there was any single thing that tripped the switch. But I just remember thinking it. I don't believe this anymore. And I just remember going to the phone and calling my, you know, ex-father-in-law who had been a minister and was a therapist and talking to him and 
that's where I had that conversation. And I said, well, what about Jesus? He said, I don't think about it anymore. That's just so weird. Not so weird to not think about Jesus. That's all I've been thinking about for my whole life is Jesus. You know, that's, that's the, the center figure of my whole identity and my whole being is Jesus. Even be, you know, even before I had this salvation experience that I thought, I, okay, now I really have a relationship with Jesus. Even before that, I still thought Jesus, Jesus, you know, it's the answer. So then, yeah. So then it's like, okay, now what? Um, I still, there must be a God. There's gotta be a God. You know, it's just that these people are all confused. And so then I just kind of just, you know, I had to deal with people saying, oh, you just, you know, Satan got you, you know, you, you're lost now. What are you going to do with yourself? And I remember I would play, I played on this, the, the church, one of the churches I used to go to had like this church softball team and they needed a pitcher and they say, well, okay, come pitch for us. I said, sure, I'll do that. And I remember going, playing on their team and all these people praying at the, and some of the stuff is, oh, this is crazy. And one guy asked me, well, what do you do on Sundays? <laughs> You know, you don't go to church. What do you do on Sundays? Well, I, what do you mean what I do? I just do it whatever I want. I just don't go to church. And so, so thinking about this guy thinking, what, is, what, do, what do non-Christians do on Sundays? Well, I do stuff. <laughs> so, yeah, I would just, clearly I just you kind go of, to this, you go to the huh? satanic, clearly you go to the satanic temple and worship Satan, <laughs> yeah. obviously. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I just sort of just quit going to church. Well, I started going to the unique church a little bit and that I talk about that, but. I just sort of spent my time trying to still searching, learning. And so I was just, like I said, I read the Bhagavad Gita, the Quran. And, and so it was sort of a slow, more of a slow learning and undoing process at the same time. I studied I a lot you, of like, hmm? did, you, did you seriously entertain the idea that maybe there was a different God and you just had the wrong religion? No, I think I still maintained that there was some kind of God. I just that the Christians, they're just that's their interpretation of, it, and it's wrong, okay. you know. And I even maintained that for years and years. I'm now I'm sort of like, now I'm sort of like I'm an agnostic, you know. I don't I don't believe there's a God. I mean, there's a, there's this mystery. There's a mystery of consciousness that is just baffling, you know. What is that? What is consciousness? And so. I guess I, I try to, part of the reason I sort of maintain this um, is because I think if you just say, how can I say, I think, I think it's, um, it's more practical to me to say I'm agnostic, there could be a God, because God is just a word, you know, and I think if you say I'm an atheist, there is no God, I think I just, it just, puts people off, you know, it turns them off and you're not, they're not even going to, they're going to shut you down, not even listen to you at all. Hmm. Even though I tend to think that there isn't whatever God is, it's energy, you know, pantheism or panpsychism or something like that. I don't, you know, I just, I, what I do, I tell God's a metaphor, you know, God is a metaphor that describes this mystery. And some people, they they use this metaphor you know, to explain a lot of different things. And so, yeah, I believe in God. I believe in God as a metaphor. Whatever you want to do with that, do with it, whatever you want. Yeah. But so, sort of, yeah, I just kind of like, yeah, well, I guess when I left, I said, well, there must be a God. There must be a creator to explain all this. And so I would just read in the Quran, said, oh, this is garbage. And I read the Buddhism, like I said, and it's, it's mostly philosophy. There's not a, really a God in there and doubting and different things and study psychology. And so it's, it actually has taken me a long time to even undo a lot of the stuff that was in my head all these years and to understand myself and learn about myself and figure out how my own brain works, how my own, own, own emotions work and how to That's a good point. see them, you know, how to, how to manage them and look at them and understand them. So yeah, it's like you have to admit that the the roots of this tree were so deep in the earth of your brain that you know it's you can't just like chop off the you know cut off the 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 top of it at the trunk like there's there's roots that are still down deep. It's very real. Well, the 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 thing of it is really is you have a you have a world view as a Christian where, like I mentioned earlier, there, there's everything is just a matter of choosing between God and not, and it's all about Jesus, and so. 
it's just such a messed up worldview. It's just nonsense. And so then you have to say, okay, what's really going on in the world? What's really happening around me in my brain and other people's brains and sociology and psychology and stuff and understanding yourself. So you have to really learn what's really going on in the world because you, you're starting off with some wrong answers. And then once you get rid of the wrong answers, then you have a blank slate. So, okay, now what's going on here? You know? Yeah. So that's sort of, I guess that's probably best described my sort of, transition can i ask with with that final stage of it did you have any kind of thoughts about the afterlife and do you did you then and do you now think that there is somewhere that we go after we die and if if you decided that there's not a place does that shake you up or how do you approach all that well i mean i think that like the first after leaving christianity for about the first two or three years i i um so I'm still questioning it, you know, I think, okay, I'm going to find the answer to this. And so after about, like I said, reading all the other holy books and studying it, I said, these are people that have been thinking about this for thousands and hundreds and thousands of years, writing down their thoughts, but they're just men. Nobody knows. I just reached the point. Nobody knows. Everybody just guessing. There's no evidence. You know, I looked at NDE some and like okay now that's just a brain oxygen deprivation you know pilots get it you know this sort of similar experiences and i don't there might be something to it i i don't really think so and um Hmm. and then you have then you have people with uh you know do psychedelic drug experiences and then they come oh yeah i've seen you know there's a guy that i uh in one of the groups i'm on he always he's pushing this you know, psychedelics to get to know God. I know that there's a God. I says, no, it's just a drug thing, man. You don't know that. How can you know? So maybe, maybe but anyway. So I just realized nobody knows, you know? Yeah. So where I'm at now, you know, um, I studied this guy named for quite a few years named Jay Krishnamurti. He was like, a, um, he was an Eastern. He he was actually it was funny as I learned about this guy when I was in Bible college as a cult leader, and then he was the head of the Theosophy, and then he disbanded all and just became a, a roaming lecturer type guy. And he's really interesting. Has some good insights. But I read a lot of stuff from him for years, and then I, you know, then I sort of got into Sam Harris. So yeah, he's awesome. I think Sam Harris, as far as I'm concerned, from what I've seen, he just has, has such a a rational sort of broad perspective and understanding where he just brings in information from everywhere to sort of explain things. And, you know, he's open and he's, you know, he's done psychedelics and he'll say, well, yeah, it just makes you think, you know, basically that's what he says. It just blows up your worldview to where you think, okay, I need to start looking around more than I have been. That's basically what it seems like it's doing. Yeah. So that's sort of where I'm at. I just think, I don't know. Nobody knows probably nothing. I need to just, I just need to keep learning and try to understand myself, not contribute to the insanity and chaos that's going on in the world. Try to um, be some kind of a influence that sort of educates and mellows people out, you know, love, you know, love, love, love thing sort of, but. Yeah. I, I would say ditto to that. I feel like in, in a lot of ways, um, a lot of, a lot of parts of atheism is basically saying, not necessarily we have all the answers or even any answers we're just saying we know what the answers aren't yeah uh, we, we know it's not in these organized religions we know that these yeah. are man-made and that they're fabricated and, and heavily evolved and copied yeah. usually from other sources and <clears throat> i think just just being able to anticipate you know for whatever time i've got left in this life to say yeah i'm going to try to leave it better than i found it yeah. i'm going to try to the best generation can. free like to just truly have a, be a free thinker to to say, hmm. like, if I want to be religious, that's fine. But if, if I want to investigate it deeply, and if I find it wanting, and I find out that this doesn't sound right, that that's a perfectly legitimate option to say, yeah. I'm just, I'm going to walk away, as opposed to this whole shunning, and while wow, you're an atheist, you must be a bad person. Um, yeah. You must, you know, yeah. you have no morality, obviously, you know, you're, you're the reason that our world isn't, isn't, isn't progressing, oh, yeah. the good things, Crazy. just all this craziness, and to say, you know, people have, I, I attribute a lot to, or, or liken it a lot to autonomy, 
where you might say to your kids as you're as you're training them uh, as they're growing up you might say to them like look if you know say you've got a little girl you say look if 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 you go to some family gathering and the, all the people want to give you big hugs and at some point you say to yourself i really don't want any more hugs you know or i don't want hugs from that yeah. person whatever like you it's your body you get to say who gets who gets to be close yeah. who gets to touch you bodily autonomy is such an important message and i think most parents you know these days are, are being very respectful of that and doing a good job yeah. at that from what i can tell but like to translate that and say well what about thought autonomy like like yeah. you, just like you can say i don't want to be hugged anymore i i need the space bubble i'm allowed to say no like well, what about that same thing with religious thoughts like i want to be able to say no like i i, I don't want so and so to hug me i don't want to believe in blood magic i don't want to believe in scapegoating i don't yeah. want to believe in a book that has stories of genocide, whether it was real or, or, or a parable. Like, I don't want a book that has genocide under any circumstances. I don't want it. There's a splinter in my mind and I'm going to get it out. And for it to just be yes. like, okay, like to say, that's okay. You don't have to let everybody yeah. hug you that you don't want to. You can just say, yeah. I'm, I am taking a different path here. And, you know, thought autonomy is a big issue. And most, oh, yeah. most people cannot, like the idea of not indoctrinating children into this oh, yeah. is, is horrifying to them that's like that's ultra liberalism it's like no no you can teach them what you want what you believe but to give people the true freedom to say if this doesn't sound right no problem yeah. make your own path but I, yeah. I understand that when you're when you're when you really believe that that to walk away from it to say oh i don't think that's true that you are you are literally putting yourself in danger of hellfire i understand right. where people are coming from but yeah. that's where the issue comes up like you need to then if, if, if there's that much at stake you better know where this thing came from because yeah. if you're really going to you're going to intimidate young children from the earliest right. days it's... about this you better be right you better be yeah. right because otherwise you are literally doing psychological oh, yeah. child abuse yeah. it is it's abusive really yeah yeah but you said something just just early on in this last bit about um about you don't know what the truth is but you know it isn't true i mean that's like i was saying this the christian murdy thing uh, this Christian Ritty guy, right? He says, you know, we we get, we get to the truth by seeing what is false, basically. Yeah. So that's what I did. I just kept digging and said, well, what I've been told is false. That's not true. That's not true. Just start checking up. Not true. Not true. Not true. Not true. And pretty soon, it's all gone. Now what? You know. So yeah, scientific. Yeah, effort. and then you know the the whole thing is be like you mentioned, a thought autonomy. I I have to feel feel free to actually question and doubt. And you're the the. It's that's the culticness of Christianity. You're not free to question. It. You're afraid because either Satan is deceiving me, or I could end up going to hell. It, 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 you just the fear just is just cripples people. Yeah. And like you say, um, developing uh, some critical thinking abilities and, and be able to question it and, and, and emotional intelligence. You know what I believe. What I'm my doubt is a legitimate doubt my questioning is legitimate i should not be afraid of that i'm feeling uncomfortable with what this bible says here oh no no the bible says no can't no that's satan you know no these emotions these feelings these thoughts they're legitimate you need to look at them but you know that's just so discouraged and even it's more than discouraged it's shunned it's discouraged it's it's a cult brainwash tactic, basically. And it's sad. And to think that there's millions of people stuck in this. It's, uh, yeah. yeah. It's amazing, so too, it's, how many parents would, uh, I guess you, what you might call, I don't know if it's gaslighting is the right word, but how parents yeah. would, if, if you were to say to, to kids um, something like, <clears throat> I mean, just, I'm just going to use a, 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 an example of something very inappropriate for children. Let's say that, you know, Uncle so and so is is you know touching your kid inappropriately, and your kid comes up to you and says, "Hey, Uncle so and so did something, and I want to tell you about it, Mom and Dad." If you're anywhere near healthy as a parent, you're going to investigate it. You're going to certainly protect the child, yeah. and whether they, um, you know, no matter what happened originally for them to think that thought, it's yeah. going to scare you, scare the bejesus out of you, and you're like, "Whoa, you know, what if it's true? What if Uncle so and so did do, touch my little girl in, a, in an appropriate way?" and you're going to say to, to your children, you are allowed in every way to, to object. You're allowed to object to stuff. And, and yeah. I, I applaud you for objecting to unhealthiness. Yeah. And yet when you look at 
scripture and you say, I, like as, if you were to say it as, as a as a person as, as if it were a, a child looking at this message and saying i'm deeply uncomfortable with a book of genocide i'm deeply uncomfortable with a book that ever says land theft or slavery or stoning or genital mutilation or uh you know the racism and the tribalism the, the 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 way the child brides like i'm deeply uncomfortable with this yeah. Somehow, even though you would you would hopefully protect your children and, and call the police or whatever, investigate this quickly and, and, and give your child the ability to say you are allowed to, to completely object to anyone pushing something on you that's inappropriate. Yeah. Somehow, even though to me, genocide, slavery, land theft, child brides and all that, that is deeply inappropriate. Even if it's just a parable, it's inappropriate. Somehow they say, no, no. If you reject this book, you're inappropriate. And yeah. like, it's it's amazing the disconnect yeah. that occurs. It's absolutely mind-boggling. Oh yeah, it is. And you, know, you mentioned gaslighting. I you know recently started thinking this is this is the whole Christian thing is gaslighting in a, in a sense because you are not you are the problem. You know, um, you can't trust your own thoughts. You can't you know the whole, you know, well, my thoughts are but far above your thoughts. I can't remember that verse, but anyway. The whole Bible is about you can't trust your horrible, evil, terrible person. You can't trust anything you think, anything you think. You just have to give totally everything over to God and Jesus. You you lose any. Well, you mentioned the word autonomy. You lose all autonomy. Yeah. And so you're not even you're not taught to think for yourself at all. You just to yeah. follow the follow the dogma, follow the beliefs, step in line. It's it's and then and the sad thing is is it, it does that to you in a religious sense, but then it, it, it shuts you and that permeates everything in your life. You know, you, you, you become just as like a zombie almost. You know, it's, but anyway, yeah. yeah, the gaslighting thing is like, Oh, geez, you can't trust yourself. You can't trust yourself to believe. You can't trust yourself to question. You can't trust yourself to think. What do you have? If you can't just all you have is your brain. What, yeah. what else you have, you know? And in some ways, you're almost taught to not just not trust yourself, like Proverbs 3, 5, you know, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own, own, own understanding. But also in the sense of like yourself, the, the personhood that you are, you're, you're taught to uh, to hate yourself. It talks about putting oh, yourself yeah. Yeah. to putting yourself to death. Uh, you know, Old Testament pictures, hacking Agag to pieces like you cannot be on the throne. It has to be Jesus. So in, in, in the aspects where you keep on trying to usurp God's place, you, you literally have to kick yourself off the throne. And, and it really is like you, yourself, your sinful nature is, is, is in the way. Yeah. And so you're, you're taught to, to say, I don't even know if I can see reality right. And oh, it's yeah, like, you can't. It's, it's crazy. And, and the idea of it questioning, is. you know, Judas, I'm sorry, not Judas, uh, Thomas, like blessed are those who have believed without the proof. I know, just, isn't that crazy? Just believe. <laughs> and that's virtuous, you know, yeah. to believe without any, any evidence, just, okay, just, yeah, that's the that's what God wants. You not think about anything. Just follow blindly. That's that's the that's the most virtuous thing you can do. It's crazy. It is. It's, it's, it's sad. Is. It's psychological. The psychological damage. I, I try to say that to people that the amount of psychological damage that, that goes on. It's just especially when you study a life like so I have. You know, because I thought about becoming a therapist. You know during some of this transition plan. So I really dug into psychology because like I said, I thought, man, this, this has answers. And to really see the subtle psychological damage that Christianity does to people that you don't even see, you don't even notice unless you're paying close attention and understand this. It is just horrible. Yeah. It really is. I, and we I, haven't even, I guess we haven't even touched on some of the aspects relating to, um, you know, patriarchy, misogyny, relating oh, yeah. to the, the, yeah. the deeper aspects it's, of purity and shame culture and virginity culture. Oh yeah, there's it's, there's, it's, it's, there's so many layers to this onion. It's crazy. Yeah, and I and I get people on these, some of these groups I'm in. They say, "Why are you even in this group? Why do you hate God so much? Why do you even care about stuff?" I said, "I because I'm a, I care about the damage I have seen Christianity cause myself and other people. You know, it, I care about the harm." That it causes you don't you don't want to see that but there's a lot of harm yeah anyway so it that's is. that's a lot well yeah. I, I appreciate your sharing your story today um i did want to ask before we wrap up i know we asked a lot of questions th throughout your story but was there any questions that i didn't ask or anything you wanted to mention before we wrap up i think you covered it all really well i think you do a great job of uh, 
interviewing. I enjoyed all the interviews I've seen you do. You're, you've got a talent and I think you're doing a great service. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I appreciate your voice and all this too. It's, it's been really cool to see the idea of people realizing that their stories matter. Like to me, it's, I, I had one person even, even say like, Hey, I've, I've seen all your cool stories. Why do you want to interview me? I'm like, I'm just me. You're just little, you can't like the employees, like I'm just little me with my little story, but like, your story matters. And I, I think it's really yeah. cool too, that um, the idea that some people, some people's personalities and some people's stories are going to hit people better than I ever could. Like, yeah, I, I would love yeah. to be like, hey, when Tim gets up and speaks, everybody likes what he says and everyone resonates. But the reality is that's not going to happen. But there might be someone else with a different personality, a different tone, a different background. And when they speak, you know, oh, yeah. someone that's listening has has heard me maybe a dozen times and I haven't really made much difference. But that one person I interview that's got this kind of story, like, wow, that's I can relate. And I, I love feeling like these stories are, are empowering the people sharing them. Hopefully it's yeah. cathartic yeah. on some level to people, but also that, that the listeners are like, yeah, this, this is, there's, there's some stuff here. We need to unpack this. This is, this, mm -hmm. this, this isn't just like you said, I'm fighting God or I hate God or whatever. Like there is some real issues about reason. There's good reasons to leave Christianity to, to, to oh, literally yeah. deconvert. And I appreciate your being willing to share yeah. your story today. That's been and I, great. And I think it's, I think it's encouraging for people to, to hear others and I, like when i got out it was 90 90 92 i mean there was no internet there was nothing hmm. i mean I think like, geez you know if i could have you know it was sort of helpful to see some of the people at unity church that i went to that tell a little bit about them but the information is just amazing on the internet now and, and to hear other people's tell their stories it's like okay i feel like it's just Hopefully this is going to sweep and get rid of this cancer, <laughs> this Christian cancer. Yeah, that's a good way anyway. to put it. Yeah, and the internet's been such a game changer for this. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, I just want to say th thank you again, Bill. Um, I appreciate you sharing your story. Some some painful stuff in there. I'm sorry for all the hard, painful parts of that. But thank you for being willing to be vulnerable and share huh? this. And I just I really appreciate your time. This has been really good to well, hear. Well, I your appreciate story. you taking the time and reaching out to me to do this. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Well, let's um, right. let's do it again sometime. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks. Thanks, Bill.